Here we go! Welcome to the Nintendo Power Zone. We are a video cast slash podcast dedicated to bringing you the best Nintendo related topics. I'm your host, Nice One, and joining me today is the full staff of Jaden Winsong and Blues. Welcome back to the show, guys. How are you guys doing? And are you ready to talk some Nintendo? I am, and I am talking Nintendo already, so let's talk more Nintendo. Yeah, I'm always ready to talk Nintendo. That's uh, that's my life right there. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, as we approach E3, we become accustomed to the media freezes from Nintendo and pretty much every game developer, but there's always something new to talk about, so first we're going to discuss all the news that's been trickling out, then we're going to add a brand new segment to the show that Jaden pitched, but that's not all, folks. In our second half of the show, we have a very awesome interview with Ian Flynn, the writer of the beloved Sonic the Hedgehog, Mega Man, and upcoming ARMS comic book. So it's an amazing show we have for you today. So let's go ahead and get the ball rolling by moving into the Powered Up News. And our first news topic is the death of Mitomo. So Mitomo launched in March of 2017, and it died last week in May of 2018. Uh, yes, the There's a lot of thoughts on that we have on Mitomo. I want to start by saying that Mitomo was Nintendo's attempt at a conversational app. Uh, they're sort of like social media, so to speak. So they had their own mini version of Facebook, one that would link directly to your Nintendo accounts. And it was a lot of fun. In the early days of Mitomo, I had used it a lot for promotional use uh, for the podcast. I would take the photo uh, editor and I would took the the me versions of myself and Mario After Party, and I'd put us in weird poses with you know Nintendo backgrounds, and I'd use that you know as a way to promote what we were talking about on that episode. Send that out on Twitter, and it caught a lot of attention for the podcast in its early days because uh, you know obviously we started two years ago, a little bit before me Tomo actually launched. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And, that you know, I love the support Mitomo got, but it wasn't a perfect app. Uh, I do also want to point out that this is the first mobile application that took advantage of the Nintendo DNA partnership. And since then, we've gotten uh, Mario Run, uh, Fire Emblem Heroes, uh, Animal Crossing, uh, supposedly a Zelda game down the line. And I believe that's it thus far. Uh and they they basically made all their apps with the exception of Dragalia Lost. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on the death of Mitomo? Well, um, as you mentioned before, Mitomo is is very much Nintendo's kind of foray into um, social media, but not. Which uh, actually, if, if we look at Nintendo and what they've been doing for the past, I don't know, ten years, they've been kind of getting in there with Miiverse, but also not. And so one of the, one of the things that I think is most tragic about uh, Nintendo and their handling of this is we see baby steps evolutions of, of, of these forays into social media, but it always feels like it's one step forward, two steps back. When it comes to, to Mitomo, I really would have liked, I mean, I love N- Mitomo. Let me, let me just preface that first because I thought it was a great idea. But that being said, uh, I would have liked to see it wrapped in with the actual like Nintendo phone app, you know. I think I think it suffered because it was segmented from everything else. It felt like it was only part of the larger puzzle. And I think that's t- to me that was the uh, biggest opportunity that I think Nintendo uh, missed out on cashing in on and I would love to see them implement them in the future now that we have the new um, Nintendo internet thing and updates on the app supposedly coming soon. I would love to see it come back in that form. Yeah, I agree. Like if they had integrated the two apps uh, together or just had Mitomo evolve into uh, the Nintendo online app, that would have been a lot more functionality because as of right now, the majority of the functionality for the online service app is Splatoon and I think we've all discussed that the way that it's used in Splatoon isn't isn't as far as it could be. It's not as good as it should be. Um, man, but I really did love Mitomo that first day it came out. I spent like five or six hours just playing with all the little functions on it, you know, sending stupid messages to the, my friends. I made a crap ton of friends through Mitomo, and uh, 
added them to my Nintendo Switch account because of the easy integration. And that's that integration is also present in their other apps like Super Mario Run and Animal Crossing and even Fire Emblem. But I think I made the most friends specifically from Mitomo because uh, as we said earlier, or maybe we haven't said this yet, but Mitomo had 10 million downloads in the course of its first month, um, which is a lot. It was... It was a successful launch app for Nintendo. Uh, I don't necessarily think it evolved the way it should have, but it's definitely sad to see it completely die. I don't know if you guys have tried opening the app since last week, but now it just doesn't allow you to open the app. So you don't even have access to the fun little photo features anymore. That's a shame. It's a Um, sad state of affairs. I mean, yeah, um, I was actually going to try and open it just that first, but I sort of figured something that, that might happen. Um, but in terms of, I do agree that I feel like it's not just me, Tomo, that suffers from being one half of a puzzle piece, though. I feel like a lot of Nintendo's recent stuff has sort of been like that, especially when, like, they, they make, like, the current, like, my Nintendo service was made at a weird point where it was the end of the Wii U's life cycle, end of the 3DS life cycle, but wasn't quite made for the Switch, you know? And it was made for, like, the mobile games, but then the mobile games are sort of like, oh, well, now what are we doing now that we're closing Mitomo, etc.? And, and it doesn't seem that well thought out. Um, I do miss a lot of the functionality. I do think that I hope, at least, we get some of the functions into the Nintendo Switch Online app for the phones. Like, it's so much easier, like, I mentioned this a little while ago in private, but so the friend code system, while it works, is not the best. So being able to have, like, my Miitomo friends, as you said, like, you made a bunch on Miitomo, easily in- integration into the Switch, I liked having that. Being able to get all my Miitomo friends easily onto um, my Switch was much better than having, a, what's your friend code, give me all these numbers. Like, I never remember these numbers. Um, so I liked the idea of using the phone for that a lot more, even if they got rid of the Nintendo Network IDs. Let's go ahead and move into our next big story. So uh, the competitors were announced for the 2018 Smash Invitational, which will be taking place at E3 this year. So we've got a pretty decent list of participants, all of them pro players, uh, half of them being from uh, Smash 4 and half of them being from uh, Melee. So mm-hmm. we've got MK Leo. Zero, Armada, Abadongo, Plup, Mr. R, Lucky, and uh, two-time uh, Evo winner, Mango. So we've got a pretty solid list of competitors here. Uh, I'm glad that Abadongo is uh, on this list because I don't feel, even though he's like a pretty consistent top 10 player, I don't think he gets this, the love he, he should. Uh, it's nice to see Plup uh, here on the list. The only... The only uh, Questionable invitation here, in my opinion, is zero. Uh, dude's retired. Yeah, D- dude is retired, and he's been on a downward slope since his uh 2015 run. I mean, so. he's still a really good player, though, and I feel like even though he's retired, he can still come out for events like this. Like people do it all the time. So it's not as questionable as I feel like it really is. Like even if you're retired, you know, if the people that make the sport or your competition or your game that you're like passionate about say hey want to like be participate in this grand thing officially sponsored which doesn't officially sponsor a lot of the tournaments like like they would normally compete in so to see like given these opportunities you kind of have to say yes if you're given them right um you touched upon something interesting blues that which is the fact that he is retired and when we take that into into account, this might actually be more of a marketing ploy than it is like a, an e-game sort of um, shtick. And, and the reason is because when you get someone who's retired back in, it generates hype. It's like, for yeah. example, now I'm gonna I'm be dating myself right here. It would be like uh, someone inviting Tony Hawk to a skate thing people are just like oh my god it's tony hawk well okay maybe not anymore because he's ancient but if they did that like 10 years ago after he had retired it would have been a, a pretty big deal you know what I'm i mean a pretty big combat sports fan like i love mma and boxing and last year floyd mayweather came out of retirement to fight conor mcgregor in a in a spectacle 
or a circus show of a boxing match. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's like the second highest boxing pay-per-view of all time, only after the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight. So, yeah. I mean, we, we people crave to see comeback stories. And oh, yeah. Um, Obviously, Floyd, May, uh, Floyd Mayweather had his, and I think people are hoping that there, I think there's a contingency of people that are hoping that Zero uh, defends his uh, Nintendo Smash crown because uh, mm-hmm. he did win the last uh, Smash Invitational back in 2014. Uh, uh, he beat Hungry Box to do so. One last thing about the coming out of retirement thing is like musicians do it all the time, like bands and musical artists. They announce yeah. a farewell tour, so people get like freaked out, like. This is going to be my last chance to see this artist, and then the farewell tour ends after they get a whole bunch of like ex- extra income from its farewell. Two years later, they announce, "Hey, we're doing like a surprise show, like or we're coming out of retirement," and then boom, they get more money. And it's it it is a thing that can happen. Yeah, music does it all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like so, all the representation from like you got Abidango from Japan, um, Plop from here in the states. You got some people from Sweden and all across the Europe's, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, a lot of good mix from all over the world as well. Wouldn't surprise so, me. We talked about this last time. The Smash Invitational will be held on June twelfth uh, after the uh, the uh, the Treehouse Live segment of uh, Nintendo's first day eighty three. So that's something to look forward to. And I believe right after that is the Splatoon World Championship. So there's a whole lot to look forward to uh, at E three this year. But moving on to our next article. Uh, Eurogamer did an interview with one of the writers of the Super Mario cartoon show. This would include the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, uh, the Super Mario Brothers 3 show, and Super Mario World show. And he echoed something that was stated in the interview that we conducted with Ian Flynn, saying that Nintendo was actually kind of liberal and allowed them to do stuff that hadn't necessarily appeared in game and that there was no pushback so i'm old i'm old i'm 34 so when i was a kid the super mario brothers super show was something that i would rush home from elementary school so that i could sit down and watch that that featured captain lou albana who if you don't know him he was actually a pretty famous wrestler uh before he got this gig and he portrayed the live action version of mario in those segments and he provided the voice for mario in the animated segments and the Super Mario Brothers show was good, but it was really weird. So they take the characters and they put them in like some storybook scenarios. So they do like, uh, what is it, uh, S- Snow White uh, and the and the Seven Dwarfs? But they've used like Mario, Luigi, and a significant number of Toads, or they send them to the moon and they do all this weird stuff with the characters. And uh, Phil Harnage, who was one of the lead writers was like Nintendo loved it when they did stuff like this. He loved it when he took Mario and applied them to these funny scenarios like fairy tales and whatnot. And it's so weird because we're in an era now where Nintendo is like really controlling of their IP. I mean, to the extent where something where everybody questioned the legitimacy of a game like Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle because Mario and company aren't supposed to do these things and they're not supposed to interact with these type of characters. So we we saw this very restrictive usage of of Nintendo's IP for a long time. It's really interesting to think that they had any kind of leeway whatsoever. What are you guys' thoughts on this? Something as out, out, I don't say outspoken or outlandish, but as different from what Mario is, as the Super Mario Super Show was, would never happen today. I don't care if Nintendo's being more lenient now with like the recent years, that would still just never happen. You, it, it's, today that, if it's going to be our property, it's going to be how we make it. We would not, Nintendo would not give that kind of leeway. Like the times have changed, they still have, even though Nintendo is more lenient than they have been a year or two ago, whatever. That will never happen again. Um, so I think they had a lot of interesting. They had their. They were at the right time to experiment with that kind of stuff, and, and yeah. they should be glad they got to do that because no one will ever get to do that stuff again. Yeah, I think <laughs> it has a lot to do with consumers as well. Consumers tend to be a bit more um, picky. Is not quite the right word, but I'll use it anyways. They tend to be more picky with with 
with products that they consume, I think. And so I think that's in general, this is why we see a lot of different um, companies being uh, definitely more guarded with their IPs, um, which to me, honestly, it's a disappointment to me growing up, uh, being born in the late 80s and growing up through the 90s. We saw a lot of the remnants of uh, crazy product placement, for example, on the Nintendo um, trade. Not only did we have the, the Mario show, but we also had the advent of, what is it, uh, Captain N? If oh, anybody remembers dude, him. Captain N was the jam. Yes. Except yeah. for the way they drew Mega Man, that was, I mean, the way they drew <laughs> Mega Man was terrible. But that yeah. was the jam, dude. Yeah, but my, my point is, like, in the 90s, people were able to do that, and consumers saw that, and they're like, oh, this is cool and weird and out there and radical, and, you know, and they did that. They liked that. They gravitated towards that, and I don't know why we can't do that now. Maybe people just think it's lame, and they don't gravitate towards that, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I... I don't I honestly know. think the shift in focus or in, in in the restrictive honestly came to play after the Super Mario Brothers movie happened. Like right after that movie came out, that's when we start to see Nintendo say, "We need to guard our IP much better. We can't allow this kind of thing to transpire." Now, uh, Phil Harnage did go on to say that there were a few touchstones that had to be in the game, such as Goombas and Bowsers and the Piranha Plants and whatnot. Like they had to be there, but mm -hmm. just you know, as long as they were in the script and they were part of that, they could relatively do pretty much anything they wanted. Like, and Nintendo would just pretty much approve it. And it's, I think, Brendan made a great point. You would never see stuff like that today. I mean. Look at what we're getting a new Super Mario Brothers movie, but look at who's, you know, going to be it's attached to working on that film. Miyamoto is going to be directly involved with how mm -hmm. that film is being made. The same applies for Universal Studios. There's going to be three theme parks uh, with uh, that will carry the Super Nintendo World uh, sections in those parks, and Miyamoto's directly involved with that as well. They're not just leaving these. Uh, you know, outside companies to their own devices and basically making things the way they want. They're like, hey, we're going to, you're going to make it, but we're going to be directly involved. We're going to. Yeah. You know, They're a bit more controlling, the making it for sure more faithful. They're not going to allow the storybook Snow White and the Dwarves. That's not going to happen. Yeah. That like, being said, though, I love the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Uh, even the, yeah. the crappy Zelda segment of that cartoon. Excuse yeah. me. You, you know what's funny? I was actually looking at uh, what it costs to buy some of those original Zelda CDI games. They're they're like triple digits if you can find good copies of them. So moving on, but sticking with animation, the Mega Man animated series has finally got its official title, and we got a synopsis for the cartoon. So it's going to be called Mega Man Fully Charged, and here's what the official synopsis reads. Aki Light is a regular, upbeat robot schoolboy. He lives in the futuristic world of Silicon City, co-inhabited by robots and humans. But this robot boy has a secret. Deep within his programming lies protocols that can transform him into the powerful Mega Man. When the villainous Sergeant Knight and his evil team of robot masters emerge with ill intentions, Mega Man dedicates himself to protecting the citizens of Silicon City. So, this is something else that kind of ties into our interview. And this is a very different take on Mega Man. Uh, first off, who the hell is Aki Light? It's fine if you want to make Mega Man's last name Light. Makes sense, built by Dr. Light. But who mm -hmm. the hell is Aki? Yeah. Who, where's Rock? Where's yeah, Rock? Rock was fine. This is a weird synopsis. Uh, like I'm not saying this is going to be a bad show. Mm -mm. Uh, I just think this is... A really weird premise for a character like Mega Man. I, what's wrong with the traditional Mega Man story? I think Ian Flynn proved that the traditional Mega Man story can be relatively successful mm -hmm. in other mediums outside of video games. Like I think Ian Flynn spent a really good time paying a lot of homage to you know Mega Man tropes, and to see this interesting take on it is, well, we're just gonna see how good it is. I, I I'm not a I'm not one of the animation haters. Like, I've been a lot of animation haters for ever since we saw the first art for this show. But the premise is what's uh, 
kind of pushing me away. I find the premise to be a little alienating. Uh, what happened to Dr. Wiley? Who the hell is Sergeant Knight? Uh, and why does it have to be light versus night? I, this is so weird. This is a weird premise. I'm not sure I, I like where this show is going to go. Now, I could be wrong. When this, when this airs on Cartoon Network, this could be fantastic. But to me, this just sounds weird. Uh, to continue with the synopsis, <clears throat> Uh, it says, equipped with his Mega Buster arm cannon and the ability to absorb the power of his opponents, he bravely battles the wickedest of villains. In this brand new series inspired by the iconic Mega Man video game, comical action-packed adventures abound as we follow the adventures of Akilite, his alter ego Mega Man, as he strives to balance his life as an ordinary robot boy and amazing superhero. What are your thoughts, guys? So, uh, first of all, Aki tends to, as, as a name, usually... Uh, they use the character for Autumn, um, but without using seeing what sort of character they're using, it's hard to it's hard to say which one they actually mean because it could also mean like um, emptiness or void, uh, something like that. Uh, well, keep but, in mind, this is being done by Man of Action, who created Ben Ten. I don't think they have any concern for the tradition, uh, the traditional kanji uh, versions of what. Uh, definitions of what this character's name is. Yeah, they probably just thought it sounded cool. <laughs> but with that, uh, that wouldn't surprise me. But in general, like I don't I, see. My problem with a lot of these things is is they tend to tend to be too like kid glovey Saturday morning cartoony, and that kind of just kills it for me. Um, it's hard for me to get into into stuff like that. And I don't know. Looking at the looking at the synopsis and looking at the artwork and just when you take everything and you try and smash it together in a whole, that's what it looks like to me. And it looks like one I'm probably gonna avoid. Um. So up until like a couple days ago, the synopsis actually bugged me. I, it, my opinion has changed. So in terms of like the name translations, I don't see why they needed to be like Rock was fine. Why change to Aki? I'm not entirely sure, whatever, as long as the show is good, maybe maybe they won't mind it. But um, aside from that, like, I always kind of said, like, well, I'll just see the show when it comes out. Because, like, even though the synopsis sounds kind of bad, if they do it really well and make a great story, the synopsis doesn't matter. If it's something I enjoy watching, it doesn't matter. But I actually don't mind. So you, you mentioned that Ian Flynn made traditional Mega Man story work. Um, and I was talking with some guys, um about the new Ninja Turtles um, TV show that's coming out in Nickelodeon for the Splatfest that's currently going on. Um, Donnie, ver er, yeah, Donnie versus Raph right now are the finals that will be going on this weekend. But So we got a first look from Nickelodeon about that show. And so apparently Raph is the leader instead of Leo. And apparently it's also a prequel, which are things mm -hmm. that are kind of interesting to think about. Um, obviously every incarnation of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is more or less different in some like story-wise or whatever but I was told like people were hating on like why is Raph the leader instead of Leo like why is this a prequel why can't we just get into all the good stuff and blah 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 and I'm and some guy pointed out that like hey you know a lot of people sort of write themselves into squares or corners or get t boxed up with the stuff that's already been done it's not new it's not cool and you end up with the same stuff that's been it's not fun and, and if they could do this prequel sort of right and, and explore other areas of these characters, times that we haven't seen before, you know, this evolution, whatever, and ex different ways to take the characters, different stories, I feel like that's where you could get into some interesting stuff. Obviously, with a series like Mega Man, um, we have a lot of different iterations as it is. I've already sort of done different things. Mega Man EXE, Mega Man, Mega Man X, etc., um, so you have different iterations as it is. I'm pretty sure that this Aki Light is its own iteration, I would say, right? I mean, where else would it fall? It's not Mega Man X. It's, his design is completely different from anything else we have, so I'm pretty sure it's his own iteration. Um, and I feel like they can... The, the Ben 10 guys and Generator Rex guys can do some good stuff when they put their mind to it. I feel like if they focus more on like defeating Sergeant Knight instead of, like, his school life, it might be a bit better. You know, school life isn't a bad thing, but then you end up, like, Pac-Man to go see Adventures, you know? Yeah. Well, and uh, That show uh, was... Oh, my God, that show was abysmal. 
I, I, I to season two. I stopped somewhere season two just because it was so bad. I couldn't stop. I watched um, that one hour special that they had for the that that premiere. I was like, I'm done. Um, the Hanna Barbera Pac Man cartoon from the the eighties was better than Pac Man the Ghostly Adventure. That's because Hanna Barbera knew what they were doing. Uh, Brendan had a nice uh, transition. Uh, back to Splatoon. So we do know that it is going to be Raph and Donnie in the finals, but in Japan. They started their Sanrio uh, across Splatoon uh, Splatfest, but it goes a little bit deeper than the games, and we've talked about this almost ad nauseum uh, at this point, but uh, Splatoon gets a lot more love in Japan, and this uh, Sanrio collaboration has had some real-world ramifications uh, where they are getting a clothing line based on this Splatfest, so there's a Hello Kitty shirt, a My Melody shirt, and these other two Sanrio characters who I don't know, but they're getting real world clothing that mm-hmm. is tied to what you're going to see in the Japanese Splatfest. So, again, while I'm jealous of the idea behind it, I'm not jealous behind the branding because, again, as I said, I'm not a prepubescent girl, but <laughs> it would have been really awesome if there would have been somewhere where I could have bought that Splatfest shirt that featured the Ninja Turtles here in the United States. This, these kind of collaborations really bother me, and we're starting to see more and more of them. Like, with every Splatfest, there's, like, some real-world collaboration in Japan that we're just not getting here, and I want NOA to step up the way they promote Splatoon. I really do. I want them to, to really just get on the same kind of boat that Japan has gotten on and just get us these kind of collaborations. And it's even cooler because these are limited, these are limited edition, you know, pieces of clothing. Like once they're gone, they're gone. And the fact that they're they're double branded is actually pretty cool. So, any thoughts on the Sanrio Splatoon uh, real world crossover collaboration before we move on? Honestly, you summed up exactly everything I think there needed to be said. You know, not promoted right, missing out on the promotions, and I don't know, I don't know. What, yeah, you said everything I was gonna say. <laughs> All yeah, right, pretty much. So, sticking with Splatoon, uh, they there was an announcement uh, that stated that uh, on June 9th, there was going to be some shocking Splatoon news that it, it would shock the world. And this was uh, reported by Weekly Shonen Jump, obviously the biggest manga producer in the world. A Nintendo uh, themed publication reached out to Nintendo for comment, and this is what Nintendo had to say. Although we normally, although we do not normally comment on rumors and speculation, we can confirm that contrary to the rumors circulating, the Japanese weekly magazine in question has not written any article with an announcement related to Splatoon for June 9th, with with which it is a baseless rumor. But there has been this picture circulating from the latest weekly Shonen Jump that debunks Nintendo's debunking of the rumor so there's this really interesting image uh and it's from it's a piece of cover art and it's showing this new splatoon symbol one that's not something we've seen in game and that's going to be top released on june 9th so there's a lot of like contradictions going on here and i don't know who to believe anymore nintendo themselves called this baseless but then Literally the next day, we have a we have a leaked cover that indicates contrary information to that of which Nintendo has you know released. So what's going on here, guys? Are we getting shocking Splatoon t- uh, news on June 9th, and what could it possibly be? Um, I stopped following the story after I saw the initial Nintendo debunking, and now I don't know where this new symbol is. So I'm trying to find it really fast, but. I mean, I had back when they just like when the rumor was just circulating, I had a whole list of what I expected. Um, and so what was it? I think I said like a couple new like stuff, like a new weapon, a couple new weapons, a new stage, um, etc. Some stuff with the Octo expansion. Um, we might see Inklings in Smash as like a trailer, like just see how they play or something. And then the last thing I think we were probably getting was a spin off game that was. It wasn't a spinoff and like be like a mini, but maybe like, putting Splatoon characters in a different genre 
much how you know Mario is very malleable. I assume we can see maybe a Splatoon RPG um, or something, but like a different genre to put the Inklings in. I think more than anything, uh, we're probably just going to get information about uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cameos or collaborations with other games. Like Inklings and Smash Brothers, uh, I would love to see a uh, a well, Inklings, not a, an Octoling in Smash Brothers. Excuse me. I would love to see Inklings in something like uh, Blade Strangers and some kind of funny fighting game or whatever. Um, if anything, maybe it has to do with uh, further further branding. Um, it maybe a uh, 3D hologram uh, concert, something like that, because I've done those before. Um, in general, though, it'll probably be something more along those lines if there is something uh, as right. opposed to an actual game. So I apologize. I forgot to add that link to the show notes, but I sent it here in the chat so you guys can take a look. So now the the new image that we've we uh, that we're sh- we're shown for this shocking world shocking uh, information has been released by Kotokoro Comics. And obviously they produced the Splatoon manga, uh, f- you know, in Japan, which is, you know, printed in by Viz here in the States. And I don't read Japanese, so I have no idea, but very cool artwork. And there's just the weird symbol. It looks like a squid, but it has like this big round eye. It's, it's a weird image. I'm Obviously I'm going to post it here in the video for everyone to see. But yeah, I initially thought it was going to be a spinoff game as well. Uh, something for the 3DS, most likely. Uh, but, I mean, we'll find out June 9th. Uh, Koro Koro Comics is, uh, does have an official image uh, within the pages of whatever issue this came out in. So we'll find out. Big news. But I think it's going to pertain more to the manga world versus something that is shocking for the game world. So Yeah. Yeah, I think now looking at this, I think it is. If Nintendo's debunking it, but the manga company and comic companies reinforcing it, I think it's mostly me for manga and comic. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead. We'll move into our next story. Monster Hunter's Double Cross is finally getting an international release. Uh, it got a name change, uh, one mm-hmm. that we should all be relatively familiar with. Monster Hunter's Generation Ultimate. It is going to retain. Uh, it's 3DS uh, cross compatibility features, which is something I assume that they would drop if it ever got an international release. I figured they would drop that uh, functionality, but it's going to retain that. So this is a big game. I am excited. Mm-hmm. I've been calling for this game since the announcement last year, and I know they said they had no plans for it, but I knew they were lying. Capcom, you're liars. Uh, they, I, I'm pretty sure they waited to see how successful... Uh, Street Fighter, uh, Ultra Street, Super Street Fighter 2, whatever edition was on the Switch before they decided they were going to bring this game stateside. But it's a it's a good win for uh, Switch owners, especially those who were patient, like myself. I was patient. I knew it was yeah. going to come eventually. Uh, if you imported this game, I apologize. Thank you. The apology means means a lot. Um, I, I did not call Capcom's bluff. I thought that they were saying, you know, with with worlds coming to PlayStation Four, PC, and um, and Xbox, you know, I thought well maybe maybe we won't be getting G- Generation Four coming back on the Switch in the states. Maybe we won't get in. I was just so in doubt after Worlds, and just, they said they had no plans. I'm like, okay, I'll get the Japanese version, and I did. And I have no clue what I was doing. Like you can figure out what kind of quest, but then farming materials for the armor, you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what you need, and that's the real struggle. And that's where it was, a lot of frustrating hours ensued. Um, I feel, so, what I really like about this game, though, is I like, obviously, the, the functionality where you can play with uh, people who orders. have the 3DS. Mm-hmm. But you can take your save from the 3DS and transition it to the Switch version. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that is really good functionality. I want more games to do this because how awesome yeah. would it have been uh, – if you could have taken like your 3DS save on uh, uh, Hyrule Warriors and just transplant it to the Switch iteration uh, that's going to be coming out later this month, would have been a, would have been really cool, wouldn't it? 
Mm -hmm. And I really do love the functionality with like cross play between 3DS and Switch. That is incredible functionality. I want to see more games do just the save transferring is awesome, but at minimum, like more games do this. I think like it's Monster Hunter, like Sushi Strikers, Way of the Sushido, and like some other game that I'm probably forgetting. That's like we only have three, which I guess is more than I really expected. Um, I assume but, they'll all be linking uh, via Wi Fi and st- not yeah, infrared yeah. sensor. Because well, it could because imagine. the Switch does have an IR sensor in True. the uh, Joy-Con. It could. That's but, a really cool integration. Either way, though, um, all I really want is to see more support. Like if we could get a, a Zelda or a Mario that does that, because a lot right now it's like smaller in titles and third-party titles that are actually taking advantage of that, and no one else seems to be doing that. Not even Nintendo. And so I feel, I feel like Nintendo Mario Kart could get away with it. Mar- Mario Kart um, could. Mario Kart Mario could. I feel Kart like Pokemon totally could, could if they made the new ones for both 3DS and Switch. I don't think that's happening, though. Um, I think it will be Switch dedicated. But if they did do that, you know, that's a great way. That's great functionality, cross-functionality with Pokemon. So moving on, the Famicom Classic Edition is getting re-released in Japan in a slight variation. This will be a golden edition released in conjunction with Shonen Jump, the world's most popular manga, and it will feature Shonen Jump based Nintendo games. So there, I believe, are 20 games in total, so 10 less than on the original Famicom edition, but all of these are licensed games. So the list of games is as follows. We have Tag Team Match Muscle, which, you know, the Ultimate Muscle series, or I don't know. I think it's like called Kinuku Muscle in Japan. There's a Dragon Quest game on here for some reason, uh, but I guess it's basically because of Akira Toriyama. There's going to be the Fist of North Star, uh, Dragon Ball game, Shenron no- Nazo, uh, Kinuku Man, Kinuku Se Oi Sudatsusen. Uh, I butchered that, but that's an ultimate muscle game. Uh, Saint Saya Ugen Denetsu. Captain Subasa, another Saint Saiya game, Saiki Ryu, uh, Famicom Jump Hero Retsuden, Saikage, man, the, Saiki Gake, oh, fuck this name, Otoko Juku Shipu Ichigose, that, that's a horrible title, I don't even know what that means, Ankuku Shinwa Yamato Takuru Den, Den, Densetsu, Tenshi Wo Karao, uh, Hokuto no Ken 3, Dragon Ball 3 Gokuden, Captain Tsubasa 2, Dragon Ball Z Kiyoshu Saiyajin, uh, Magical Taluto Kun Fantastic World, Famicom Jump 2 Psycho no Shichinin, and Ruku Denashi Blues. That was terrible. I Congratulations. Bad. Thank you for your hard work there. All right. I, that, that I, could, not that. I could not do that. I could not do that. So oh, a lot of these games are classics, though. Like, Fist of the North Star, Hulk no Ken, Saint Seiya, Captain Tsubasa. Yeah, a lot of these are classics. So, I've played one of these games. Only uh, one. Only one. It's actually Dragon Ball Shenron no Nazo. It's a retelling of the original Dragon Ball game. Here in the States, it came out as a game called Dragon Warrior. And they basically did some creative... Uh, editing to the game to remove Goku's big hair and make it more like the hairstyle I currently have. But you play through the the Dragon Ball, like uh, the first six episodes of Dragon Ball, and it's really bad. And I didn't know I was playing Dragon Ball until years later, when I, you know, as you know, as a teenager, when I rediscovered Dragon Ball and found out found out about the Ox King, and I was like. He looks familiar. Why do I know him? And then I realized, like, I was playing a Dragon Ball game, and I had no idea I was playing a Dragon Ball game because of the weird branding that happened with Famicom to NES transitions. This is a cool Famicom, though. It's painted gold. The controllers are gold. And it looks really... I mean, the controls are gold and red. And it looks nice. I want this version. And it's it's a tie-in with Shonen Jump. I don't know how they're going to be distributing this version, but it looks really cool, and I want it. And it, it's celebrating Shonen Jump's 50th anniversary. This is this sucks because I would like this version. Like, 
of, of the Famicom. I would rather have this than the NES Classic Edition that I have now because that's just a really cool looking system. Thoughts? So uh, one of the things that this does mean, though, uh, as I as I derivate a little bit, uh, it does it does mean that um, we are getting the NES Classic uh, re-released, which is uh, something they just announced about a week ago. But um, yeah, but. Uh, I have always been a fan of the way the Famicom looked over the NES. Um, I always thought it looked a lot better. And so, uh, uh, while, while I don't really advocate for um, emulation of uh, current-gen stuff, it would be kind of cool to pick this up and uh, use it on uh, American games. I just want this. I want the game. The game list just sounds fun. Like, just a North Star, I'm a big fan of that. I don't seem a giant uh, Dragon Ball fan. Uh, I have a little bit of interest in Captain Subasa. I mean, who doesn't like a good soccer game? Yeah. No, this is a uh, really solid list, honestly. Like, I recognize a bunch of these as old anime titles from way back when. Um, I mean, well, I... Jump is the world's most popular manga. They've had a lot of, like, cross appeal here. So, I mean, a lot of these titles we are familiar with. Not their Japanese titles, obviously, as I couldn't pronounce a third of them. This is a cool concept, and you could probably get away with doing a Famicom edition like that here in the States uh, with our licensed games. Like, could you imagine a Famicom Classic Edition that had games like DuckTales, Chippendales, Rescue Rangers, Ninja Turtles? We could totally do that here in the States. Nintendo just isn't willing to do the same amount of work to make it happen. But uh, Nintendo of Japan totally is and that that just sucks and, and you know here's the other thing is that i know for a fact that there are people here in the states that would love to buy a famicom with these japanese games but with in, with an english translation they would love to I, I mean i would be one of the first people in line to be like yes let me play a bunch of these japanese games that i never played in the past because they weren't released here yeah, I, I'm not even sure if any of them were, with the exception of that uh, Dragon Ball Shinra no Nazo. And again, like I said, they the way they released that game was to basically not call it a Dragon Ball game. They just called it Dragon Warrior, and they made it its own thing. Yeah, Dragon Quest as well, I think, eventually got a release here as a different Dragon Warrior game. Interestingly, Dragon Quest was Dragon Warrior for the longest time in America, because Dragon Quest uh, was like a a movie, or it was a different um, it was a different franchise back then, so they weren't able to name it Dragon Quest. Um. So the one thing I want to say about this is that a yes, I agree. It's good that we're getting another NES classic that entirely discontinued. Um. The Gold Edition is nice. I kind of feel like if we do get more of the classic consoles. Gold re-releases which could be cool, but the thing that I'm most excited about is that we're getting it with different games, um, and that's obviously we're not familiar with a lot of these games in the states. Um, we're probably not getting these games in the states, but the fact that they can re make another NES classic or Famicom classic NES in this case and give it different games is really interesting to think about. You know, if we could go back and we did the wish list for um, Super NES um, class, or no, N64. N64. Yeah, yeah, we did our wish list for that. Um, but if we could go back and do that again with NES, like, again, had another opportunity to do that. That could be fun. You already mentioned Ninja Turtles and DuckTales. Like, there's a lot of possibilities to re release these more and more. And um, we, I believe we were going to talk about it later, but. In terms of virtual console, this might be the new virtual console we get is packs of NES classics, you know? Well, yeah, I've been saying that. Version 1, version 2, version 3 with a bunch of virtual console games on them. Yeah, I've been saying that for a while, that, that, mm -hmm. that Nintendo is replacing virtual console with classic systems. So we'll use that as a segue. Uh, Nintendo, Nintendo Switch yeah. Online was mm -hmm. the big news of last week. So they finally released details on Nintendo Switch Online and there's a lot to look forward to here. There's a couple of things that people have complained about, but we're going to get into that real quick. So let's start with uh, the pricing plans. So this is going to launch in September. It's 
been free up to now, but there are three pricing plans. There's a one month, three month, and a 12 month model uh, for individual uh, packages. And then there is a family package. So let's starting with let's start with the one month plan. That's going to start at three dollars and ninety nine cents here in the states, three pounds and forty nine quid in the UK, and three dollar three euro and ninety nine three three ninety nine euro. Mm-hmm. Uh, the three month package is going to be seven ninety nine here in the states, six ninety nine in the UK, and seven ninety nine for the rest of Europe. And the year package is going to be nineteen ninety nine here in the states, seventeen ninety nine in the UK and 1999 in the rest of Europe. So I pretty good individual pricing plans. Uh, the year, the annual plan being obviously the best buy in the bunch, $19 and 99 cents for a year a of year. service. That's, that's what a third cheaper than the all the company. rest with Xbox gold and live gold and PlayStation plus. PlayStation. Yeah. 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 So, so I think price, I think the price is right. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are saying that it may not be for what comes with the uh, package, but I honestly twenty dollars just I just pay twenty bucks just for the service itself, just to have the service because it means that hey, Nintendo hopefully is using this money to pay for servers so we can mm-hmm. get away from like a P two P on games like Splatoon and whatnot, mm-hmm. and. There's one more payment plan, and that is the 12-month family membership, and that's going to be $34.99 in the States, $31.49 in the UK, and $34.99 in Europe. And it allows for eight family members to uh, to be part of this plan, and it's usable on multiple switches. Initially, that had to come out, and a lot of people were upset thinking that it was for profiles, but mm-hmm. the next day Nintendo announced that that would be available for multiple switches. So instead of having to pay $40 uh, for my switch in for my fiance switch, I can just get the family plan and pay $34.99. Uh, and both of our switches can use the Nintendo Switch online service. So that's pretty cool. I like the family pricing a lot. And like that's also interesting that. to think about that it's for eight systems. And if you're only doing two at minimum, you're still saving. It's not like you have to meet a threshold of three or four for it to actually be worth the price. It's immediately at multiple switches, you're saving for a year. And that's really nice as well. Yeah, so it pays for itself to do Mm -hmm. the the annual family membership uh, once once you have one more switch. Mm -hmm. So I think the pricing is is actually pretty fair. But this very much reminds me of the Apple uh, iTunes model where you could do the Mm -hmm. family plan. So they also announced a few free games, so 10. And all of these games will have uh, – they're going to be free to anybody who purchases a, a annual plan. Mm-hmm. And uh, here are the 10 games. So we have Balloon Fight, Dr. Mario, Super Mario Bros. 3, Donkey Kong Ice Climbers, The Legend of Zelda, Mario Brothers, Soccer, Super Mario Brothers, and Tennis. And a good number of these games will have additional online functionality, which means that I could play tennis from here in Florida with Brendan – in Michigan, mm-hmm. and we could just go on play online. So that's actually really, really cool. I like the fact that some of these games are receiving an online treatment. Uh, now, unfortunately, they're all NES games, and Nintendo did originally announce 20 games, including Super NES games, but I think they're holding off on the announcement for those games in uh, around for around E3 so that they can talk about this in a little bit more depth. Uh, I think the most important news is that Users of the uh, Nintendo online services will now have access to cloud saves. So mm-hmm. you can back up your data via the cloud, which means if you break your system or upgrade your system, you don't have to go through the process of a lengthy file system transfer. You can literally just get your saves from, from the cloud. I love this. I love that this is a feature of Nintendo's online service, and it and it now finally makes sense as to why the Switch didn't support cloud surfing, uh, cloud saving outside of the box. Mm-hmm. It, I don't mind this. I don't mind the fact that it's a paid for service. I definitely think it helps justify the cost of this. Actually, this is this is the majority of the cost for me. Just, I would pay more for the for the the the, day, the cloud saving. 
and they've reasonably priced the whole package. So I actually think this is a fair price for what we're getting. And I, I don't agree with a lot of the complaints that I've heard about uh, the Nintendo Switch Online services. But what are you guys' thoughts on this? Um, I'm not sure if I've said it before, but I mean, going back to Virtual Console once again, you know, if you were to get like an NES game on the Wii U or on um or on the Wii, like they, like what I had the math a while ago, but it's it's a whole lot cheaper if you pay twenty bucks a year for these initial twenty games and more that they add later than buying twenty games off the Virtual Console. It's so much cheaper, and so if I could get a subscription Virtual Console, I'm already down for that. That's something I think is definitely worth the price in itself. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we'll get more. Um, we are getting a bonus online treatment for some of them, which is also nice. Um, other than that, like comparable, I believe Sony has something similar where they allow like PlayStation Two games, PlayStation One, and I think PlayStation Three games through a subscription service as well. Um, which they charge separate from their PlayStation Plus. That's a separate thing. They have like PlayStation Plus, PlayStation Vu, and like PlayStation Now. I want to say, and like one yeah, is cable. Called, PlayStation Now. Yeah, PlayStation Now is like the subscription for like like PS One, PS Two, and PS Three games, which is essentially the equivalent to what we're getting. Obviously, PlayStation One, Two, and Three have higher spec games, whatever than NES and Super NES. But I'll still gladly pay it. Um, the fact that we also do get like discounts similar to PlayStation Plus, etc., is nice. Cloud saves is a huge plus, as you've already said. Um, the only reason I would not see it worth it as from an online only standpoint is if we did not get servers. I'm pretty sure we're gonna get servers. But if they just like don't make the switch to servers, I'll be kind of upset. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's the reason for the delay. I think that's why they decided to wait mm-hmm. so long. Why we got the uh, online for free for so long was so that they could find some good cheap servers. You know, not just mm-hmm. cheap servers, but good yeah. servers. And this is a way of getting that done. I mean, mm-hmm. was it, was it a long delay? Oh, yeah, of course. yeah, that was a really long yeah. delay. Like it'll be over. What are we gonna be like at a year and a half by the time this actually launches of, of the delay? But if they got service, it's going to change a lot of games, yeah. specifically Splatoon, mm-hmm. as well as Splatoon the is really Smash going to take advantage of that. And Smash, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, we've said it a few times. Nintendo can't launch Smash with the same server issues mm-hmm. that it's had in previous iterations. It has to get better. It just yeah. has to get better. Especially um, since they're really trying hard to to market the Switch and make it a successful console. It can't suffer from any of, like, you know, the travesties that happened with the Wii and the Wii U. Mm-hmm. Um, my own, I have a couple, so my big complaint, and it's only personal, is that The Legend of Zelda is on the list of the 10 NES games. And that hurts something that I was going to make in the NES prediction, or NES, E3 prediction video. Um, and that bugs me a lot that we had that announced because that was i won't say it yet so you gotta wait for the e3 episode but i had a, i had a very good a prediction with that and that kind of really irks me uh <laughs> so yeah i had to put that out there uh another piece of information that followed the this news was that the virtual console uh would would not appear on the nintendo switch uh, nintendo specifically said this there are a variety of ways in which classic games from Nintendo and other publishers will be are made available on Nintendo Switch, such as through the Arcade Nintendo, Archives. Yeah, such as through Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo Switch Online, Nintendo eShop, or as package collection. Nintendo Entertainment System, Nintendo Switch Online will provide a fun new way to experience classic games that will be different from the virtual console service, thanks to enhancements such as added online play voice chat via Nintendo Switch Online app, and various play modes on of Nintendo Switch. So, I honestly... So basically they're saying there are going to be classic games coming to the Nintendo Switch. They're just not coming in the way that we've grown accustomed to with the virtual console. Uh, the Nintendo Switch Online essentially means we're getting enhanced versions of games that we've had for years. And... Uh, not, and on top of that, look, Arcade Archives has done a really fantastic job 
with releasing all the Neo Geo classic games, and recently they released Punch Out, and they released a, the arcade version of uh, Super Mario Versus. So there are games coming, and I think at this point, Virtual Console is an antiquated uh, branding system that is now associated with not just the Wii, but the Wii U, and the Wii U is we can we've said it before it's a failed hardware system and they need to they need to get away from any type of wii u associations when it comes to how they market the nintendo switch so it makes sense that the virtual console branding is what suffers and i i don't mind it and i've said it for years that the the classic edition consoles is nintendo's way of circumventing the need for a virtual console we're getting these awesome classic mini systems that are coming bundled with, you know, 30 games in the first one, 20 games in the second one. And let's be honest, those are the games that people are really buying on the virtual console. The, the games that they put on these systems, I guarantee you, are the games that sell the most on virtual console. So I know a lot of people were upset that Donkey Kong Country 2 wasn't on the Super NES Classic, but Donkey Kong Country 1 was. Well, probably comes down to sales. Donkey Kong Country 1 probably broke outsold Donkey Kong Country 2 by a significant margin and that's why it appears on the classic consoles. Yes, it's not a perfect system as far as the way the the number of games that we get on them, but it's it's a good system and it's a fun system that not just appeals to hardcore Nintendo fans, but it appeals to casual Nintendo fans who may feel nostalgic about those specific consoles. Like the any the reason the NES Classic was successful is because there's a bunch of people who aged out of gaming years ago and they're like, man, I remember the NES. I had a lot of fun on that system. I there were a lot of great games. So they didn't even necessarily look at the games list. They just see a mini NES and just associate that with their memories of this, you know, their nostalgic feelings, and they made that impulse buy. Mm -hmm. And we don't need the virtual console for that anymore. Now, would it be nice to have the branding in that? Yeah, but it's not necessary, especially if you're buying the the classic systems in conjunction with your already bought Nintendo Switch. What do you need the virtual console for if you've already made that purchase by buying your classic system? See, That's I think you touched on that. I think you touched upon uh, something really important. This is this is my theory why they they changed the name uh, to just the Nintendo Online Service or whatever. It's branding. Yeah, it's really all it is. The, the, the Nintendo Online Service is going to offer pretty much the same exact thing that the Virtual Console does. It just has to have a different name because they're throwing in some extra bells and whistles, and uh, because it's it's more of a service as opposed to a uh, a way of looking at how they distribute games. And um, this is something that really kind of irks me about the Nintendo community as a whole, is that we've got a lot of people complaining without actually taking taking a moment to step back, look at the big picture, and realize that nothing's really changing. Um, one other thing I want to mention. You said that the games that are put on the Classic Editions are the ones that sell. But I also find it cool that we get games such as Star Fox 2 um, that weren't even released. I think that's a great way to put those out there, as we've said before. So on top of the ones that sell the most, games that sort of like were were more or less what's I don't I'm stuck in limbo is that's the wrong word, but never saw the light of day get a chance to finally see that light of day, which is nice um, as well. I think ultimately, when it comes back to Nintendo Online, I think we're getting a really good value. Twenty dollars is not is ridiculously cheap and people are complaining because they don't want to have to pay money because they don't know what's good that that's that's my opinion hmm. which is going to get me a lot of heat but that's that's uh, honestly when you look at what you're getting and how much it costs and it's uh, a pretty good package honestly yeah, yeah. And people need to realize that surfers cost money cloud mm -hmm. saves cost money it's not like nintendo uh, if you look at the industry it's it's very unlikely that Nintendo is building their own cloud. They're probably contacting someone like Amazon or yeah, um, or Zynga, else. for example, yeah. and using their cloud services, which do cost in the thousands of dollars in order to do. Mm -hmm. So twenty dollars is pittance in comparison to um, to what everything costs. Yeah. Now Nintendo also did state that not all games will require Nintendo Switch Online in order to go online. And obviously there's gonna be a contingency of games that won't use any online features 
whatsoever. They're going to, like, like Xenoblade doesn't really have an online component other than downloading DLC. So, you know, I, I would assume Pokemon would be one of the few games that doesn't require uh, Nintendo Switch Online when it comes out because there's really no need for uh, a dedicated server uh, with Pokemon. I mean, they they've have them already. But, you know, the Pokemon company pays for them already. So we'll I see think- how it all goes. But that's going to wrap up the news uh, for today. And that, like like I said, we have a different style of show today, so there's a lot of stuff to cover. So Plus, it's also been a relatively busy couple weeks since we last did a show. So lots of new information came out. Lots of little news, nothing too big. I think the Nintendo Switch Online was the biggest news topic. So we're going to go ahead and we'll move into our new segment. And this is our collectibles corner. Uh, this is a segment where we're going to suggest new or newly released or upcoming Nintendo thing collectibles. Just a lot of cool stuff. There's one thing that I want to talk about as a group. Uh, and then we can go ahead into our individual picks. Uh, starting with this thing, the the, uh, the group topic, Pokemon Center is releasing Team Skull clothing. And I think this is actually really cool. This is limited to the Pokemon Center. It's expensive. It's not cheap. Um, but this all looks really cool. And you can dress like a member of Team Skull. So they've got a few items. They've got the Team Skull Relaxed Crew Fit uh, t-shirt. They've got the Team Skull accessory kit that includes the bandana, uh, the beanies, and uh, a hoodie set that is the same hoodie that Guzma has to wear. And then you've got your messenger bag and Team Skull socks. These are actually pretty cool collectibles. And I I think a lot of people would actually enjoy dressing up as members of Team Skull, which is actually kind of funny because in-game, the Team Skull members had to buy their gear. They didn't just get the gear for being members of Team Skull. And that's kind of represented here with this set of collectibles. Uh, thoughts on this? Uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, it depends. I So, so he, he, here's my thing. A little bit self-disclosure. Um, when it comes to the way I tend to dress, when I'm not on the... Um, on the podcast or not feeling excessively lazy, I tend to, to dress in like suit sort of stuff. And so as cool as it would be to get this sort of uh, team school um, wear, it is totally not my style. So, <laughs> that is something I'll probably be avoiding personally. Honestly, this is something I would wear. I, I wear a lot of like graphic tees and, and graphic hoodies and whatnot, like on my downtime. So this is like right up my alley and things that I would wear. Uh, I'm not sure about the accessory kit. I don't think I need the beanie and the bandana, but as far as the shirts and the hoodies are concerned, I definitely rock that. All right, but moving into our individual uh, picks for this segment, I have one that I recommend, and then I have one that I recommend staying away from. So let's start with the ones that I would recommend staying away from. That would be the Paladone. 3D lights. If you're watching the video version, I went ahead and I grabbed one so you can see it. Paladone has a name for itself. They've made some great products that I have reviewed here on the channel, such as the uh, the question block light, the mini question block light, and the question block tin. Like they make a lot of great accessories for the household that have some functionality. Uh, what I love about them is is that they took things from like you know, the world of Mario and the world of Zelda, and they brought them, you know, into our households. And they can be used, you know, you can use the question block light as like a little mood light, you know, sets the mood in the room. Or you can use the question block tin to hold like your controllers or whatnot. And they've even made piggy banks like that. So they have some kind of functionality, but they're these icons of like the video game industry. And I love these things, but this product, is bad. It's retailing for $14.99 and it is made of cheap plastic, requires AAA batteries, no USB connections whatsoever. This is something I would recommend staying away from. Uh, we re- I reviewed it on the channel and I gave it a six, which is the lowest score I've given something in over a year. Uh, it looks great though. Like, like design wise, I think it looks really good. It does look like a boo from Super Mario Brothers, but as far as like the price and what it's worth, it's definitely not worth fifteen dollars. I would have paid, you know, in hindsight, this is like a seven dollar product, and they're 
profiting seven dollars every time I every time somebody buys one of these. So I highly recommend staying away from that product. Uh, the product that I do recommend, though, forgive the milk. Whoop. Okay, so the product that I do recommend is the Sonic the Hedgehog Cable Guys controller holder, which you can see here in the video. Now, this is a great product. Really high quality. It's made out of vinyl. Got a lot of heft to it. And this can hold your controllers, your cell phones. Uh, and uh, it holds some things better than others, but for the most part, it really does work as advertised. And it comes with a, uh, I believe, a 10-foot micro USB lightning cable uh, adapter. So this thing really works. And you can put, you know, put the controller in, in his hands or your phone. He'll hold it there, prop it up, and he'll charge it. This is one of my favorite products of 2018 thus far. This is this is one of the – I think I already did a perfect 10 here on the channel, and I love it. And it looks like classics on the Hedgehog, so that's also a win right there. This is a product I highly recommend. If you if you see it, I recommend scooping it up. Uh, and they're going to be releasing a lot more products. They're also releasing a Crash Bandicoot Nintendo Switch holder that's going to be at a larger scale, but it will hold your Switch in Crash's arms. And you can play, uh, I guess, tabletop mode while Crash holds your Switch for you. So that's really dope. Those are my picks for Collectibles Corner. All right. I already pretty much uh, gave mine away. This is the Ocarina by STL Ocarina. They're, um, they've got a really good sound. And they've got uh, various different um, materials that they make them out of. So they got the ceramic, and but I got the plastic one because I was cheap. But what's nice about them is uh, they also have various different bundles. So if you're a Nintendo fan, you can actually get the, uh, the Ocarina of Time uh, in a nice uh, case and with a songbook for all of like 70 bucks, which I think is a pretty good uh, deal in my opinion, although I, I don't really know too much about Ocarina since I'm only getting into it. Um, so I can't tell you if that is actually a good deal. Uh, but from what I know about music um, and what I know about uh, how it sounds, it is a pretty good. This is probably um, where I'm going to buy an upgraded Ocarina when I eventually get better. Um, so I do recommend that. STL Ocarina, check them out. Um, in terms of things that are coming up in uh, soon to be released, um, more more Zelda stuff, of course, because because me. Um, there is a True Form Midna figure by F Four F First Four Figures. These uh, these guys are they've got they've got a bit of a following, um, honestly. Yeah, I I have to 100% agree. First four figures, they make great products. Uh, this is one of the few products I have. So this is actually the first four figures Super Mario 3DS holder. This is something I bought years ago. I think it was like right when the 3DS first came out, and they did a fantastic job. The sculpt is great, high quality vinyl. The build quality is just phenomenal, and I love. The fact that it holds the 3DS. The only problem is, is that it only holds like the standard 3DS model. It doesn't, you know, fit any of the upgraded versions like the 3DS XL or the 2DS or the. Maybe the 2DS XL may fit in this. But yeah, First Four Figures makes some great products as well. They also made the. Uh, All right. Me, they also they also made the uh, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild statues. Yeah. Uh, that that also look really phenomenal. I love the way that first four figures does their thing. So yeah, I, I saw that true four midnight and I was super excited about it. I was like, man, but the problem it's with first really four figures pricey. Is, yeah, it's not cheap. They're not cheap, but when you buy one of their products, you know, you're getting something that's really high quality, high caliber. It's almost, you can almost justify any purchase you make from first four figures. Yeah, the exclusive version of, of Midna is $484.99. And that's before you factor in shipping. And because these come from the first four figures is located in the UK. So you expect to spend at least another 50 bucks on shipping. It's and I don't know if that also that actually factors in tax either. I don't know how that works in terms of international. But uh, and then they have the definitive edition, which is get this. Seven hundred and eighty-four dollars. They've got all, they offer payment plans though, so that that helps. But still, really expensive. But they're tall too. They're like 
uh, they had a, a soda can uh, comparison where they stacked soda cans to tell how tall they were. It was like six six soda cans tall. So well, they released that Sonic the Hedgehog last year, uh, where he's running doing the figure eight, and his feet are on fire, and it's it's like three feet long. It's like three feet long, and it's like two feet high, and then it's got like this LED LED light up function where his feet light up, but also the 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 uh, the end stage sign that Sonic runs past that spins also spins as Sonic runs. It's a beautiful statue, and like I would love to have it, but it's like nine hundred bucks. But yeah. they do make some really good stuff for the less discerning collector, the collector who's got like a baller status budget. Yeah, uh, you know their newer stuff is is a lot better than their older stuff, in my opinion. Some of the faces on the really really old works, I'm talking like circa 2006, kind of look a bit off to me. But the new Midna is fantastic. I'm probably gonna, well, we'll see. I have to wait until I get the Majora's Mask in first, and we'll see how that one looks. Well, their Breath of the Wild Archer Link uh, was 80 bucks. It's one of the lower end statues. It's made yeah. out of a uh, uh, plastic. Of uh, uh, PVC and vinyl, that still looks really good. I mean, it's an, I mean, it was worth it. And I didn't pay the full eighty bucks. I actually got it at retail. I found it at a Best Buy, and I got it on sale for like forty. So I paid half the price, and it's a beautiful statue. It, and I love how they include like weird things, like so the box is actually like a diorama. So it's a background of like all the imagery you see in Breath of the Wild. So like they they're really creative in how they not only make the product but the way they use the packaging to kind of like build like that aesthetic. So first four figures has always been phenomenal at what they do. And I, I really wish they would make stuff, you know, for more lower end, you know, shoppers. Cause I would like to own more of their stuff, but I, I can't always justify like, you know, a $600 purchase. Yeah. And the other thing is the size for me too. Like the Majora's mask is huge. And that's it for me. I don't have room for Midna. I would love to have room for Midna, but I don't. So, And that, that's all I've got in terms of my collectibles corner. Awesome. So, guys, that's going to wrap up this first half of the show. Uh, our second half is a phenomenal interview that we did with Ian Flynn, who is the writer of the Sonic the Hedgehog Mega Man, an upcoming ARMS comic book. That's going to be conducted by myself in blue. So, from here at the Nintendo Power Zone, we're going to go ahead. We're going to let you go and slide you into that interview. Uh, before we let you go, we're going to hit you up with these social media links because you won't hear them in the second half. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at Nice1983. You can email me at Nice1983 at gmail.com. And you can hit me up on Facebook, facebook.com slash Nintendo Power Zone. You can hit Blues up at the King Blues, uh, Blues spelled B-L-O-O-Z. You can hit him up on Twitch, uh, the same username, twitch.tv slash The King Blues. You can hit me up at YouTube at uh, Jaden Winsong. Same thing with uh, Twitter and uh, Twitch. Um, also, if you want to chat with us more, we do have a Discord channel. So follow our uh, the the Nintendo Power Zone on Facebook. We will give out links uh, occasionally in the group, uh, which will be set to expire after a certain amount of time. So please follow us. Please like us. And if you want to chat with us, you know, just monitor the page. So, guys, that's going to be it from us. We'll catch you in the second half of the show. Stay fresh. Welcome to the Nintendo Power Zone. We are a video cast slash podcast dedicated to bringing you the best Nintendo-related topics. I am joined by my co-host Blues, and with us both today is a very special guest. This man has worked for Archie Comics, IDW, Dark Horse, and he's been given the task of taking beloved video game characters and turning them into comic book icons. And I'll tell you what, folks, he's doing a damn fine job. Today, my guest is none other than the illustrious Ian Flynn. Welcome to the Nintendo Power Zone, sir. Thank you for having me. All right, so first and foremost, it is a massive honor for us to have you on the show. I know my team and our audience is super excited, and uh, we want to hear your thoughts on working in the comic book industry and what it's like cultivating an extended universe for video game characters. So I want to start with your tenure at Archie, since that's, you know, that's your longest run that I currently know about. So 
you've been very busy when it comes to translating video game IP into comics, Sonic the Hedgehog being your most well-known adaptation. But you've also given a voice to Mega Man, and you are prepping the release of a new comic book based on the ARMS IP, uh, which is my favorite fighting game uh, in recent memory. But before you start writing these books, uh, is there anything you do to familiarize yourself with the characters? Well, it depends on the IP and the situation. Like, with Sonic, I grew up on Sonic. We were a Genesis household. I knew the little blue hedgehog like the back of my hand. So, you know, when I got picked up for the comic, I had already read all the comics. I had watched the cartoons and the animes and what have you. So I didn't really need to do any research. I, it was a duck to water. That was my element. I was home. Um, with Mega Man, I've always appreciated the franchise from a distance, but I am notoriously bad at Mega Man. Like, <laughs> pathetically, sadly bad at Mega Man. Like, Most people are. Legit lost to chill Penguin more than once bad at Mega Man. So with that one, I had to do a lot more research. And that came, thankfully, because the Mega Man fan base is so passionate and meticulous. There were numerous walkthroughs and FAQs and wikis and stuff to go through. And not just of game material, but of various manga incarnations, uh speed runs, regular 100% runs, the obscure Japanese stuff, and that I just, you know, read up on as much as possible and tried to apply it all. With ARMS, I played that, not very well, but I played that a bit, but Nintendo supplied a huge amount of internal documentation for me to work off of, stuff that I'm pretty sure is not public information for the most part. So I had a lot of fun taking these insider notes and using those to craft a story so that folks will get a whole new look at the arms universe. Once we get to it. Oh man, that is awesome. Wow. Guys, if you are not just joining us, we have Ian Flynn on and uh, that was some cool, cool information. So follow up question. Uh, what mandates, if any, are you been holding to as far as the developers of these games, uh, are concerned and do they vary from publisher to publisher uh they vary of course but uh the keystone to it all is the licensor wants their property to be represented accurately uh in most cases they are incredibly generous with the amount of leeway uh arms in particular uh there's a couple of gags in there that i'm surprised that Nintendo was cool with. And it's like, okay, they're really letting me flesh out the world and let me put my take on it. Uh, at the same time, that isn't to say that I tried to you know, rewrite the arms universe and make it my own. No, 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 no. You know, they, they set the rule. They invite you onto the field. They set the rules. So you play their game, basically. Uh, as long as you're not trying to reinvent the wheel or do anything too out there with the property, they'll usually let you do what you want. It also varies by uh, time period. You know, if a new game is coming out, they're usually all across the board. Every licensor is usually more attentive to uh, the nuance and the nitty gritty. And then if there's a lull between games, they're a little more relaxed. But uh, overall, it's basically, you know, treat the characters with respect. Don't misrepresent the franchise and tell something that's fun and engaging. That's awesome, and that's really surprising to hear you say that about Nintendo because most. But of it's the also other glad people I've interviewed, Yeah, most other people I've interviewed for this podcast have said that Nintendo is extraordinarily restrictive with their licenses, but that really comes from more of a video game development background. So mm -hmm. it's cool to see that they're a little bit more friendly Lenient. as far as what you're mm -hmm. you're able to do with the book. So that's that's awesome. And they've supplied some documents, like you said, that you play their game, but you can play it however you want with us and you follow those rules. And those documents are going to help a lot. And I really hope we get to see like some of that stuff in the comics, too. Um, but the next question we got for you. Um, so the Archie Sonic comics have had a lot of history. Um, by the time you became the lead writer, was it ever daunting to have the pressure of being better than those before you on the series? Oh, it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, <laughs> I, I grew up reading the comics. And 
when I first joined, I really wanted to be a contributing member to it, not just to take it on as my own. And that's pretty much with any legacy book, you know, you have to honor what's come before you, even the stuff that you may not necessarily personally jive with. But, uh, you know, the main goal I had when I first got on the book was to reconcile all these different ideas that different writers had had over the years and what different editors had done to the book over the years and make it all one cohesive whole and to bring it back closer to the core of the license to make it, you know, a clearly sonic book. And I would like to think I succeeded in that. Most folks seem to have enjoyed it. Question mark. I think you did a damn fine job. I, I mean, there was a point, you know, as I got into my, you know, early 20s where I had, you know, faded away from the book, but then I realized they were still publishing the book. So I went and started picking up back issues and I found your run. I was like, hey, this book is really good again. <laughs> and I like how you say, you know, bring it back towards the core, like the identities of the series, because you have a way of doing things that aren't what they should be for that universe. And then they're maybe like Sonic fighting off against Gormagala, for example, like stuff like that. But it's always still Sonic at heart. And I like that. You you have a way of sort of blending the unexpected, the weird or whatever crossovers with with staying true to what the characters in the series are. Um, but next, we have the question, you were also tasked with erasing a lot of the history that had been established before you. Um, how difficult was that? And did you ever have any reservations in doing so? Oh, yeah, it hurt, but there was no way, I had no control over it. It was not to get too much into it, but there was a legal dispute between a previous freelancer and the publisher. And from a result of that, we had to dump everything. And it, it wasn't up to me. And that had been, oh shoot, like five years worth of work just out the window, which hurt, <clears throat> but that's a licensed book. You know, it's not my property. It's not my book. I am at the whims of all these other uh, outside influences. So it is what it is. The timing of it, though, was very nice because it worked out about the same time we started the Mega Man crossover, which was a ton of fun. And it gave us a nice avenue to have something separate from the main storyline and then jump into the new take on the book without having to really connect the dots too tightly, I suppose. And with the new approach to the book, which started in, shoot, 212? 222? No, 252? Shoot, I don't remember. It's been so long. I just uh, read it, so I believe it was 225. 225, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, point being, uh, with that one, it was sad that all my plans were you know, out the window, but it was also exciting because we were able to take a new approach to the book and try to... You know, what I had done before was take all these different ideas floating around and try to rein them in to make a more sonic book. Now we could kind of start from the ground up with elements that were kind of iconic to that version of the comic, but make it more associated with Sonic, so it was more immediately accessible to the general Sonic fan or the general game fan. That makes sense, yep. It's kind of sucky to get rid of the old stuff, but move into the new, in a new direction. Um, zeroing in a certain character, um, we... <sighs> We know that like this had to be done, but we feel like Knuckles is the character that suffered suffered the most. Um, as a lot of his backstory that had been built up in the comic was consequently rewritten. But um, I think he did a good job bringing him back up to speed. But how did you decide what the best direction for Knuckles was to go? Well, part of that was uh, again the licensor. Uh, a lot of what had happened to Knuckles before the reboot would not have been approved in the day and age that I was writing the book. Now, he is the last echidna alone on the lush angel Island. So having a whole bajillion different echidnas or an advanced civilization or having an extended family or political war dramas or whatnot, that it just would not have flown. Uh, and I wouldn't really be able to move forward with it because of, you know, what the licensors said. And, 
At the same time, that's not too bad because that's not really Knuckles either. So when we had the reboot, it gave me an opportunity to say, okay, I don't have to do any mental gymnastics to figure out how do I explain away all these elements that don't fit. They, they aren't there anymore. So I can start fresh. What is Knuckles? Knuckles is a loner. He's the protector of the Master Emerald. He's kind of naive, but he can back it up because he's tougher than the rest of them, the best of them, tougher than leather. You know how the song goes. And what can we do to give him companions that help explore the different aspects of his character without diluting him? So instead of giving him a bajillion grandfathers, let's give him a archaeologist buddy so that they can travel the island together, explore the ruins, delve into the mysteries a bit, and get into what it is about Knuckles instead of saying, you know, here's a bunch of Knuckles. Oh, that is awesome. That is literally, I love that answer because I, you know, like I started reading that book in like 93 and I followed it up and it, it was painful to me to, to know that you had to erase it, but you know, we don't have to get into the backstory of it all. Cause you know, it's all been, it's all out there for people to find. Um, I'm not going to say names and anything like that, but yeah, for me, I had, you know, growing up with that version of the knuckles character and to see him you know go back to his roots and evolve that way that was that was awesome in my eyes uh but my next question is uh and i know i'm not the only person thinking this uh but sonic mega drive that was the absolute high point of your run for me personally are we gonna get to see the uh, end of that uh with sonic overdrive or is this a licensing nightmare at this point Actually, we just covered that on the Q&A portion of my podcast, The Bumblecast, which you can find it. <laughs> um, at this point, I don't see it likely that Part 3 will ever come out because of reasons. Um, part of that being when we did Mega Drive, the idea of classic Sonic and modern Sonic being different ideas, different kind of mini IPs really wasn't on the table, but now that we have Sonic Mania and Sonic Mania Adventures out there, classic Sonic as a recognizable property is really out there in the forefront. So I don't think Mega Drive could work in today's climate. I could be completely wrong because there's a lot of folks above my head that would be making any kind of discussion of that happen. So maybe down the line you'll say, you know, it'll come out and you'll say, you said it wouldn't happen. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I just write the damn thing. <laughs> See, what I loved about the Mega Drive is like, I felt like you were you were going on all cylinders. Not that you you stopped it by any means, but the the comedy and the pacing and just the story, those self-contained stories all fit really well within those pages. And obviously Tyson Hess's artwork is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. All right. So... Brendan, I believe um, you have the next question. Yep. Moving on to away from Mega or away from um Sonic for just a second, going to the Mega Man. Um, when it comes to the Mega Man books, there's an essence of the character that is oftentimes lost on a lot of adaptations. Um, that's the feeling of angst that Rock has. Um, and having to fight and sometimes destroy and kill his own robot brothers. Um, when you were writing the comic, did you also notice this that was missing from a lot of the adaptations? And how did you go about? tapping into the element of the character. I know you also mentioned um, wikis and the looking at the fan material that was out there, correct? Yeah, and with Mega Man, my approach was after I did the research, after I saw you know how the games progress from 1 to 10 and beyond, how it evolves into X and the rest of the lineage, it became more of a question of, okay, how do you... What are, what are the themes of the franchise? And who are the characters? And how does this world work? And when you step back for a second and you know ignore the run, right, shoot, jump aspect of it all, you have an eight-year-old who decides to take on the literal weight of the world and weaponize himself because nobody else can. And that's incredibly tragic, but also incredibly inspiring and heroic. So that was what I was trying to get with the Mega Man book, was that Rock is taking on so much and it's a burden, but he has the strength to get through it. At the same time, if he's developed with the mentality of an eight-year-old, he's not going to be able to handle some of these bigger concepts as, say, X or somebody else. I mean, 
arguably X handles it worse than Rock does, but that's a discussion for another time. And overall, my approach to it was not necessarily to focus on the angst, because that's more Blues' thing. You know, you got to wear those sunglasses at night. But it was more that, you know, to, the, to treat the source material with respect and thoughtfulness and the biggest hurdle for it was keeping the lighthearted nature of classic versus how grungy it gets, so to speak, in X. Which is... See, I think a lot of folks have it in their mind that X is this really dark, oppressive, post-apocalyptic storyline. And it does have elements of that. But then you got to remember you fight a giant neon monkey. And it's like, remember, it, it's still <laughs> kind of bright and colorful. It's still kind of goofy. So let's not get too far down the path of this is dark and serious sci-fi. No, but that is I an element know. of the character that I think you really nailed. Just that mm -hmm. he doesn't want to do what he's doing, but he does mm -hmm. it because, he, like you said, he's the only one who can. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I love the way you captured that. And it's also interesting to think about that um, Mega Man is defending humans and killing his own to defend them. And that's got to put more, so much more pressure and weight on his shoulders, you know? Um, but moving on, uh, so Sega and Capcom are both Japanese companies. There's a lot of Japanese video game companies out there that only tend to get the rights to, you know, other Japanese-based companies and studios. So what's it like being able to work with these characters and companies as an American-based company as well as just a fan? I mean, you said that you grew up with Sonic, you were a Genesis household, you know, how is it like being taken on for this kind of role it's daunting uh thankfully i don't have to bur uh shoulder most of that burden because usually all the negotiations and all the checks are done by the editors who are working with the u.s based liaisons who are also working with the japanese branches so there's a lot of stuff that goes on well above my head and all i get are the notes at the end when it comes through so you know i'll get a pitch back that says okay they want these changed and we've already discussed this element they've allowed this to go this is what they won't budge on make your changes it's like okay roll from there usually there isn't a lot of friction because i make i take so much effort to understand the property and when i'm writing these i want them to be as true to the source material as possible so there really isn't a lot for us not to see eye to eye on. And usually it just comes down to something that doesn't really come through in translation, or maybe I've got an idea of where I want to take the series that doesn't match with the licensors, and, oh, well, I got to get over it. It's the licensors, baby. You got to take care of it the way you want you to. That makes sense. I like how you say, um, you know, it's all just licensors, people above your head. They give you sort of notes to work with and you just write you just write it um that's interesting to think about we also have to take care of the characters so then when you when you do something like the sonic and Mega Man crossover series events you know um both of them crossover with not only each other but with earth and other sega slash capcom series we talked about sonic facing off against um gore magala from monster hunter like there's a lot of this like dark stalkers gets in there i believe at some point um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens in these universes. And so getting the ability to cross over all these universes, is that ever hard or difficult? And was it trickier getting the licensing in the crossover or writing a story that made sense when combining all this? Uh, well, let's, let's approach each crossover differently because they were very different beasts. Um, the first one, the Sonic Mega Man crossover was a dream come true. Not only in what it was, because I got to play with both to sets of toys at once. I mean, that's just fun. But the way it came about is like a fairy tale, because it was Capcom who came forward with the idea. And they said, you've got the licenses to both comics. Would you want to do a crossover? So the folks at Archie said, Sega, can, can we go play in Capcom's yard? And Sega was like, yeah, that sounds cool. Go for it. It was that simple. It was that straightforward. That's insane. <laughs> And the uh, story that the office likes to tell, to my embarrassment, is I had kind of already drafted a crossover for funsies. So when they said, do you have any ideas for a crossover? So I'm like, I already do. 
and that was pretty much what we ran with. Uh, the sequel crossover, Worlds Unite, was a very different beast entirely. That one, the idea was to bring in as many different properties as we could. I have no idea how much licensing hassle the editor or any of the folks on Capcom or Sega Size went through, but they're all heroes in my book for doing all that. And I'm a little sad we had to regulate it all to the third act of the arc, but it only makes sense because getting all of that art approved by all those different studios and directors, oh boy. Oh that must boy. have been a hassle for your editors because Udon has the rights to a lot of those characters as far as comic book publishing is, is concerned. Like they have Street Fighter and Darkstalkers uh, in their, you know, in their repertoire. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we put together a wish list of properties that we wanted to show off and we sent those off to the various studios and said can we and some got yeses some got noes uh the one that we couldn't eat was phoenix Wright. uh not that he would have had a large combat scene of course that's a little above his weight class but i really wanted to see where he was defending a construction worker for allegations of sabotage and the construction workers it wasn't me it was this giant robot rhinoceros with drills on his face <laughs> and edgeworth is like who's going to believe a ridiculous story like that and then sticks with him crashing into the courtroom fighting tunnel rhino going objection and then he'd get roped into it from there but that got nixed so we had to go with something else now i'm broken hearted that that didn't happen <laughs> Oh, yeah, me too. That's amazing. I'm uh, trying to think. I, uh, with Monster Hunter, I think they specifically asked that we use Gore Magala because that was kind of like the mascot monster of the most recent game. And it really worked out because right when we were developing it, they had the Mega Man and... Uh, wasn't Sonic of the Black Knight crossover armors for the Palicos? I'm not Something sure. Like that. Maybe. So it, it was a nice little Easter egg that we could sneak in there. Uh, I remember Fantasy Star Online, or Fantasy Star in general, was off the table, unfortunately. Echo the Dolphin wasn't available. I'm not sure how I would have worked Echo into it, but, but there being no water. But at the end of the day, what's important is we got Skies of Arcadia just so I could have the Delphinia shoot Seg Sigma in the face. That was the <laughs> one thing. Out of the entire crossover, I wanted that more than anything, and I got it. So I'm happy. So let's let's wind down the Archie era. So this is a, this is a question I think is important because uh, as far as 2017 was concerned, that was pretty challenging for uh, so Archie Sonic fans. But what was that time like for you? There was a lot of uncertainty for us, but we don't know how things were going uh, from your perspective. So what was that like? No, I was in the exact same boat as everybody else. I had no idea what the future held and you know sonic was my career for 10 years that was what i was paying the bills with that's what i was buying medication with that's how i got by and all of a sudden nope nothing so there was a lot of scrambling and you know emailing editors saying hey remember me don't you want me to do something anything i'll wash your car come on um, reaching out to the contacts I had made over the years at Sega and whatnot saying, Hey, so there's rumors that somebody else might pick up the book. Could you put in a good word for me, please? I'll be your friend. And oh. thankfully it was kind of a culmination of multiple things. Uh, my resume, the amount of fan input really influenced things. Uh, there are some folks uh, higher up that know me and like what I do, thankfully. So it all came down to IDW, you know, hearing all of that and reaching out to me and saying, hey, we hear you write Sonic pretty good. You want to do it again? I was like, yes, sir. May I have another? I 
awesome segue then so we can just slide right into uh, the IDW Sonic. Uh, so you recently relaunched Sonic uh, Comic with IDW and you did so in tremendous fashion. Four issues in one month. Uh, how do you even coordinate a launch like that first off? Um, lack of sleep. <laughs> uh, there, were, there was a lot of question on how to launch the book, you know, whether to do like a standalone mini and then launch the series off of that or to just hit the ground running and things kind of morphed into the four issues in April idea. And with that one, we kept the structure of the stories very, pretty similar, kept the story kind of light so that we could focus on introducing folks to the characters and the stakes and uh, build up the very core idea of the world and then move on from there. Uh, the response to it has been absolutely staggering with all four issues going into a second printing and the first one going into a third. And you know, any one of those is really impressive, but the fact that they're four issues full priced one after the other, you would imagine there'd be some kind of fatigue that would set in, but no people just went crazy for it. And it's humbling and daunt terrifying, but I am so thankful that Sonic is resonating with so many people. And it's, it's different now because you don't have like the Archie shelf space that you probably previously had, uh, you know, because Archie is one of maybe the only comic book that you can find at grocery stores and whatnot these days. Now you're dealing with IDW who plays a lot in the direct market. That's, that's really impressive that the, uh, you're going into second and a third printing for those books. Well, I think part of it is because the Archie's newsstand presence is more with their digest, not so much their single issues or their licensed books. So I think they were competing in fairly the same place. I could be wrong. I, I just write the things. I don't deal with that side of the business. But I think part of it, too, was folks giving the IDW Sonic another chance because they IDW has a history of doing tie-in comics that and licensed comics that are very well received and they knew it was a new take on the series but with folks that they know appreciate and work well with the franchise so i th i think there was a large influx influx of people who had heard of sonic comics but were kind of daunted by the size and the backlog of the old titles so they wanted to jump on at the ground floor there's a number of ways to rationalize it. I could be completely wrong. I don't know. I'm just very happy that they're happy. <laughs> All right. So you kind of touched on it a little bit. What was it like to uh, work on Sonic without any of the Archie baggage? Uh, you had a new clean slate. Wait. <laughs> it was kind of like the last time. It, it was it was sad, but it was fun. Because with the old run, we were only a few months away from number 300 in the main title. And I had been building towards that very dedicated and you know boom out the window all your plans ashes and dust so sad move on but you know with the new approach it's you know a new way to look at sonic it's a fresh way to pick it up and shake it up and you know being that it's far more game centric this time around it allows me to focus on you know what is it about sonic that is so enjoyable and now that we are starting from scratch with this very basic cast and setting, we have room to expand and grow as we had in the past in new and fun ways. So it's exciting and it's 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 definitely different this time around since, you know, when I first came on to the writing Sonic, it was fresh out of college. It was my first professional gig. It was all starry eyed and fanboy. -y. And now here we are like 12 years later a little wiser, a little more thick skinned, a little more experienced, but it's still fun because it's Sonic, man. How can you not enjoy that? How did you come to the decision to make the book take place after Sonic Forces? Because that's kind of weird. I mean, there's, you know, if you haven't played Sonic Forces, this is kind of a weird entry point, but it still feels like a good entry point. It's just like there, you can, you can tell that there's a little bit of backstory that you're just not quite getting. 
so how did you guys come to that decision? Well, figured because it was the latest Sonic game. So those who are fans of the franchise, those who had played the game, it would be the most fresh in their minds. And since we're treating the games as the inspiration, you can say that the previous adventures have happened. So we have a backstory kind of already built into the series. We don't have to start at some point and figure out how to adapt something down the line. We can just go. As for putting it after the game, spoiler alert in case you haven't seen everything already online, uh, Eggman loses. I know, shocking. <laughs> and it gave us a nice... Uh, position to start from. You know, we're not starting in the middle of some adventure. We don't have to take Sega's story and adapt it in a way that may not work best for the comic. It's just, this recently happened. There's a bunch of robots all over the world. Sonic's got to stop them. It's a very easy premise to jump into. You know that something happened before, so you get that sense of a rich history and world to fall back on, but it's clear to move forward. So it seemed like the best way to approach it from any direction. Awesome. So you've introduced three new characters already, Rough and Tumble and Tango the Lemur. How integral will these characters be going forward? And is it different creating characters for this universe than it was for the Archie universe? Uh, I would say that they are more additions to the world as integral as anyone else. I don't want to say that you know Tangle or Rough and Tumble will stand out head and shoulders above the game cast because that would be wrong. But it's not like they're being introduced as a flash in the pan thing to be forgotten. It's they're they're more characters to flesh out Sonic's world in a way that you know the game characters don't necessarily do. Like the game characters when they are made for the game, you have to think about how are they going to play, what kind of aspects do they bring to the gameplay mechanics, what are they in terms of themes of the gameplay itself, whereas the comic we can think more thematically, structurally, you know, what can they do to expand on the characters, we don't necessarily have to think about how their mechanics work. At the same time, with this book specifically, when designing these characters, I want them to feel like they could be game characters. Like Tangle specifically was based a lot off of Rystar who has very deep roots with the Sonic franchise, if you go back far enough. And if you played Sonic Forces, the Avatar character has this kind of grapple shot where they reach out, grab something, and fling over. Arguably, Tangle could do the same thing with her tail. So you could see her being transplanted easily enough. With Rough and Tumble, they've got area effect attacks. They're big, beefy guys that take a few hits to bring down. So they make sense as kind of arena boss characters. You can see how that boss fight could be done in a modern Sonic game. And we got somebody else coming up down the line that, again, I feel like you could see how they would work as a gameplay mechanic. So they feel like they're Sonic characters. They feel like they fit in Sonic's world. And I think that's the main difference between that and the old run, where the characters were more built in the concept of do they fit in the world? Like, they're still, especially post-reboot, I wanted anything new to feel like it fit with Sonic's world, but not necessarily as a game mechanic. You know, it would feel more like they fit into the mythos of Sonic rather than they would fit into the game of Sonic. And part of that was because we transplanted the Freedom Fighters over, and a lot of them got overhauled to feel more like Sonic characters and less like ancient cartoon characters that had just endured to this point. So, too long, didn't read version. IDW's approach is to make the characters feel more cohesive to a game-minded world, whereas the old stuff was more of a mythos-related world, I guess. Awesome. All right. So, a couple more questions for the IDW run, and then we can talk about what a large contingency of our community wants to talk about real quick. And, uh, any plans to bring back event comics like the uh, Sonic Super Specials? Uh, that's entirely up to IDW and Sega. If they've got the approvals and they've got the budget for it, then sure, why not? I don't know. They've got my number. They know I want to write it. <laughs> So, 
let's uh, move into Dark Horse and Arms. How did you get the gig to write this book? Uh, the fine folks at Dark Horse said, hey, you write video game comics. You want to do an arms thing? And I'm like, sure. The end. <laughs> Very short and sweet, short and sweet. Did you, well, in that, was it ever, um, what the heck is ARMS? Did you ever have to that? No, I was familiar no, with you're it. you familiar, okay. Because I'm, I'm a Nintendo fan. I mean, okay. I, I had to switch sides after Sega lost the console wars. We Makes will sense. never forget, but we will forgive. All right. So then what's it like working with Nintendo to build the extended universe for ARMS? I know you mentioned as well, you got those like super secret, top secret lore documents from Nintendo and maybe Mr. Yabuki and the team. Um, what's it like? I uh, can't talk too much about it, especially right, since right. the project isn't out yet, but right, they've been very supportive, especially of somebody's, an outsider's approach to their material. And it's just been an absolute pleasure so far. Is there um, any particular arms character that you uh, you gravitate towards? Oh, Max Brass. I mean, everybody's fun. Everybody's got their quirks, and um, I tried to get into the meat of the characters. It, the roster is so big. Obviously, some are going to get more screen time than others. That's just the way it is because there's only so many pages. But Max Brass, oh man, every time he had a scene. He is so much fun to write. Now, can I ask how you feel about Helix really fast? This isn't a question about my own personal thing. How do you feel about Helix? He's fun in a creepy way. I can see that. Okay. It's it's like... It's kind of like... Alright, how about this? Think back to the live-action Mario Brothers movie when Daisy first encounters Yoshi and she's like, Oh my God, there's this dinosaur. I'm terrified. But then she warms up to him and is like, Oh, you're kind of cool. We're buddies now. It's kind of like Helix. It's like, you are a terrifying abomination. You are an affront to nature and all things natural, but you seem kind of sweet. Okay. Here, have a Twizzler. So, so that's sort of, you like writing for Helix. Then I take it. All right. Um, so moving on, uh, the next question is, I believe, I yours, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, May 5th was Free Comic Book Day, and the 12-page preview for ARMS comic was released, and it dies into Springman's character. Uh, so the big question is, what was the idea behind making him a legacy character? And uh, also in the game, Springman is a superhero. So are we going to see any of those superheroics uh, taking place within the pages of the book? All of that is Nintendo's. The fact that uh, he is the third generation spring man, that he is the icon of spring gym, that he had to work for that position. All of that was from the Nintendo documents. I'm like, oh, this is sweet. Let's dig into it. Let's take these ideas and bring them to the forefront to expand upon the arms universe. Um, and either it was an extreme coincidence or they really liked what I was pitching the second generation Springman, who only shows up for like a few panels. I just had like a placeholder description with the note, you know, if this is wrong, please correct us. We'll, we'll do whatever art you want. But son of a gun, the art, the reference art that came through was almost exactly what I had had in the script. So maybe great minds think alike, or maybe just maybe I got to kind of indirectly design a arms character. Maybe I, I can't say for sure because I don't want to speak for it. And what, but, but, oh man, that was exciting. Just seeing it's like, Hey, hey, hey. but um, we will definitely be seeing lots more of spring man when the real series starts up. That's awesome. And I was thinking it might, when I looked back at the question, if you said you had the documents, I'm like, there's, is that go hand in hand? And, it's awesome to see that that's right. You know, Nintendo had the idea that, you know, that that he's the next generation had to work for it. That's their idea. That's super cool. Um, but so that leads us to our next question. Um, is Spring Man gonna be the focus of the book's narrative? Is he the main character, or is it gonna focus on the entire arms cast, or you know, what what are we looking at? Again, not to get into too much detail since we're so far beyond when it's gonna be out, but Springman's kind of like the mascot character for the franchise, so he will be taking kind of the focus, 
But the roster is so big and so varied, and everybody has their favorites. I want to show off as many as they can. Like, Ribbon Girl is arguably also kind of the co-mascot, if not more so than Springman, so you'll be seeing a fair amount of her. And I should probably stop there before I get in trouble, but I, I will show off as much of the cast as I can as makes sense for the narrative. And, you know, if if it's all said and done and you're like, well, I wanted to see so-and-so do more. If it's received well enough, there might be a sequel. So, you know, <laughs> that would give me room to do more. So please buy it up. Buy lots and lots. So I can write more arms because, boy, howdy, is it a lot of fun. Well, I'll be buying two. I always have to have one for bagging purposes and one to read. So... All right. You can sign me up for two issues right away. I just wish I could pre-order oh. these things easier. Um, but so, um, in the arms, or no, arms is a relatively new game of very little story as far as what we're told. Um, and what you have the documents to. Um, but what we know so far is basically in-game minor backstories and whatnot, such as you know, Min Min's noodle shop, etc. Um, but what's it like to sort of plan and expand on these characters, and how do you take all the IP like this, flesh it out? And is it any different from working with Sonic and Mega Man, who have their stories more or less told in game? Um, hmm. Oh, it's very different. Um, like with Sonic, as I said, I grew up on Sonic, so I've always had stories to tell with the Little Blue Hedgehog. And whenever there's a new game that comes out, I can always look at it and say, "All right, this was a neat idea. Where did it come from? What can you do with it?" Uh, if it's not resolved in game, where does it go from here? Like one of the things we did with Sonic number three was, you know, in Sonic Forces, you run around with the Wisp bonds using the Wisps as the power source for these weapons. Well, who put the Wisps in these capsules? Why are they scattered all over the place? And we answered that in issue three. We got to delve into it, but with Mega Man, the games gave me the roadmap. That's the plot. Okay, I know exactly where the story is going. Where can we fill in some gaps between games? Where are some ideas we can ex expand upon it? And you know, what little detours can we take to make a more enriching trip so it's not just, and here's Mega Man 4, and here's Mega Man 5, and here is this game, as you already know, because you already played the game. With ARMS, it's a bit different because it's a different structure. It's not a monthly comic like the other two were. And because it is so new, there's room to explore but at the same time i don't want to overextend my reach to a point where you know i'm inventing stuff that may conflict with what nintendo's doing so uh i think once you see what i'm doing with arms it'll all become clear where i'm going with it and once that's established there might be even more room to expand from there but mostly it was looking at all of the lore that nintendo had crafted for it and exploring that and you know, bringing it to the forefront so that fans could get into that universe. All right, very cool, very cool. Um, so next up, in the Arms Preview comic, the main story seems to focus more or less on the Grand Prix. Um, will we see more of the life of Arms characters outside of the world of the Grand Prix? Maybe going back to Springman's Superhero Agenda or Min Min's Noodle Shop. I know you might get in a little bit of trouble for this. You can't say too much. Um, but also, will we also be introduced to other characters or other abilities, um, people who maybe use things, their arms abilities for not fighting? Like, we see a character just break a coffee mug. Like other, other original characters who maybe use their powers for construction or more mundane tasks. Big question, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you a vague yes. And we'll, we'll, we'll just say that for now. A vague yes works for me. Thank you. That's... That's more or less what I was hoping. Okay, cool. Right. As long as we explore, I want to explore this world of arms so much. It's one of the favorite gaming worlds, too. And there's no world to it, but it has such a cool idea and theme, so I'm so happy you're doing this. Comic. I mean, the core of arms is the battling, so to deviate too far from that would kind of lose the focus of what arms is. But I do want to get into the nitty-gritty and how it how the world functions where I can without derailing the narrative. Like there's some really neat backstory bits to twin tell that I don't think are public knowledge. So it's like, Ooh, 
Ooh, let's see more of that, please. What does this mean in the arms world? And I'm probably skating on thin ice. I'm shutting up now. <laughs> I was actually going to ask if we'd see something about Twintel. But um, I won't ask anymore since you are on thin ice. Okay, sure. Um, but I was, I'm very curious about Twintel still. Um, but so well, I guess a, the next we, well, yeah, next question we have are from viewers. Um, so let's start with the viewer questions, right? Yeah. So uh, the first question from our audience is, uh, how are the characters' personalities going to evolve or or get influenced through the main plot of the story? Are we speaking in general or a specific title? Well, we could uh, uh, with arms specifically. Okay. Um, again, it's it's so far down the line, I can't really get into it, but uh, it won't just be one note characterization. You know, we, we get a vi the free comic book day issue gives you good insight into who Spring Man is as an individual, but we will be putting him in scenarios where we get a better idea of his moral compass. He said, trying to be vague without getting in trouble. <laughs> we'll, we'll be digging into the characters as deep as we can, given the space and the time that we have. So this might just be a publishing question. You may not be able to answer this, but we have an international audience, and they were wondering if this book would be released uh, in the European territories. That is a question for Dark Horse Publishing. I have no idea. Um, the next question we have from the listeners are, how many graphic novels are planned? How long is this initial run looking to be, give or take? Or are you still on thin ice on that? I don't think that's been publicly announced yet, so I don't want to confirm it just yet. All right, fair enough, fair enough. We'll, we'll dig More any further than on one. that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we could say at least one, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, what will fans of ARMS love the most about the comic? Oh, I hope they'll love all of it, because that's the thing of jumping into any franchise, is are the fans going to enjoy it? Because, you know, any general reader, I want them to be entertained too, but the fans are the ones who are really going to come into it and see something new, and hopefully get a little bit more of what they want. So that's someone that I'm really hoping to please, and it's always nerve-wracking. It's like, did I get it right? Are they going to appreciate it? Are they going to be satisfied? But I think, aside from the action, of course, I, would I hope that the fans will enjoy a more robust look at the characterization of the various fighters. All right. I think I think based off the preview comic that was put out, I'd say I'm already happy with that and the characterizations were given. So I think you're doing a great job so far with it. Um, but this is the last viewer slash listener question. Um, then we got some more questions from ourselves. Um, so the Arms comic was originally announced in 2018, but it has shifted to January in 2019. Is there any particular reason why? Can you talk about that at all? No, but no, you know, right. it's... It's comic book production. It's it's one bit planning, one bit chaos, and that's for everybody across the board. All right. Fair so enough. Don't before, worry. Before we move back into our own questions, I did also want to say that I have read that 12-page preview issue like 40 times already. <laughs> and I love the art. First off, it I just want to talk about the art on that book because it's so good. It's so it good. Is. It is beautiful. And it, it's like this blend because – it pays a lot of homage to what's in the game, but it's almost like uniquely not Japanese. It it kind it's of blends easy. like a Western and and an Eastern like art mentality, and it's it looks true so to the cool. arms art style. It doesn't look too Japanese. It's colorful and bright. A lot of I don't want to say liberties, but like you'll see trees with the arms gift pretty much. You'll see some trees that are normal, some that are sort of corkscrewed curly, and that's. Really awesome to see too, and it's so fun to look at. Um, Again, it's, I, I like it's this Nintendo. Book. That's part mm -hmm. of the world, and so that's what I incorporated in the script, saying you know, some of the trees look normal, some of them got that spiral to it because hmm. that's part of the world that I was given. Very interesting. So that's cool. And so Arm is going to be drawn by uh, Joe Wynn, correct? Yep. Awesome. And man, his art was just mind blowing. And then the writing was great too. I love just the characterization of Springman, like. Him being a legacy character, but then him, ha the 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 thought process. What can I do as the third Springman? I was I thought that was just 
really fantastic writing because, I mean, fr coming from the player aspect, a lot of these characters, you know, visually they stand out a lot, but as far as, you know, what we see in the game, we don't, they're pretty one note. I mean, they all like represent what they represent. Like, obviously Springman is like the everyman and Ninjara is like your little, you know, your ninja college student, but we don't get much more than those like minor backstories in the game. So I really love the way that you fleshed out Springman and it's, you know, obviously you said Nintendo came up with the idea with him being a legacy character, but what could he bring, you know, to the Spring Gym? I think that was very uniquely Ian Flynn. No, I, I definitely agree with that. The fact that you took the legacy character and you made, you gave that goal and you made that very clear right from the beginning to make Springman, I guess, stand out, not only apart from the games, what we know, but in the comics and this goal and ambition that he has was very well done. Well, that's my, that's generally my approach to any of these game tie-ins is look at all the information that's there and rationalize its world and its character. So, okay, if this is who Springman is, and we know that he goes to compete in the Grand Prix, why? What is the logical progression for the character to go from point A to point B? In your time at Archie, you got to work with some amazing artists uh, like uh, Pat Spaziante, Tyson Hess, and uh, Tracy Yardley. You and you know Tyson Hess has kind of risen to start him to the point where he's worked on Sonic Mania, and now he's working on the Sonic Mania shorts. What's it like working with these three artists? Uh, those three specifically, and so many more, is an absolute delight because they make me look good. Really, it's. You know, the, you can write all the text in the world you want, but any, especially with a property like Sonic, where so much action has to feel fast and visceral in a static medium, you need talented people who can convey that sense of urgency and kinetic franticness. And they're all just masters of the craft that can take my crazy ideas and make them work. Tyson, in particular, when we were doing Worlds Unite and there's that two-page spread with the Delphinia shooting Sigma and every single character in the crossover jumping across the page. The script itself is like, for just those two pages, is like three pages of text laying out, you know, in the background, at these tiers of the page, in the foreground. This is all these actions. And at the bottom of it all, I said, look, Tyson, if this doesn't work, I don't want you to break your hand. You know what I'm going for, but you know, just do it how you may think it'll work. And son of a gun, he got it down precisely. Everything that I scripted, he put precisely on the page and made it look so very good. It's just, oh. Again, I would be nowhere without the talent of these guys, and my hat is always off to them. So Tyson has provided some cover art for the uh, the book. Are we going to get to see him do any interiors anytime soon? Uh, that's up to his schedule, and I don't know. I would love to see him draw anything, any any anything. Do you uh, ever have any preference as to who is drawing? Very, very rarely. Um, sometimes there will be a story where I feel like a particular artist might fit the tone better than another one but all of them are talented in their own right so if it's like oh i think so and so might be the best and it's like no this person's doing it. it's like yeah okay cool there's, uh, there's never a bad choice all right one more time back to arms uh can we get pat spaz to do some cover art for arms ah uh, wouldn't that be nice uh, again it's up to his schedule i don't know all right so we have one more question and I think this is one that I want to hear the most. Are there Agreed, any video yes. game IPs that you haven't worked on that you want to tackle? And if so, why? <laughs> oh, oh, there's a list. Um, if I could finally do a Star Fox book, I could die happy. Yes, um, please. Based on the 64 storyline from there, thank you very much. 
I'd love to get my hands on the Kirby franchise. If I could tell the Dark Matter saga in comic format, that would be freaking amazing. Uh, if I could do anything, anything with Skies of Arcadia, I'd be over the moon because that is my f one of my all-time favorite games. Uh, I, th I personally think I have a neat way to tackle a Metroid comic. Maybe that's me tooting my own horn. I don't know. I, I, I think I know how to make it work. I've got ways to pitch a um, Splatoon book if anybody's interested. Just hit me up. Nintendo, make that happen. Nintendo, I know you know us. I know you listen to us. Make that happen. I don't care which publisher. Please get me the Splatoon comic book. <laughs> now I gotta ask: Could you do you have a, do you think you could make an Echo the Dolphin, an entire comic for Echo the Dolphin, work? Um, it would be maybe one of the trickier properties, but Echo has such a weird psychedelic lore to it that I think it could work. It's just you'd have to find the right balance of the narration and conveying all these things moving underwater and finding that right balance visually of these, you know, vast empty oceanic spaces versus the more claustrophobic cavernous spaces or like the coral areas. I don't know if you had the right artist and the right approach to it. Yeah. Yeah. It could work kind of like one of those, uh, interesting more European styled comics, I guess. Okay. I had to ask since you brought up echo the dolphin earlier, but couldn't throw them in the series you were working on. Uh, you know, basically, if it's a video game that has an inkling of a plot, I'd be happy to take it. Oh, Shovel Knight! Shovel Knight would be good. Oh, yes! Um, Yacht Club Games, get on this. Yes. Uh, well, we, we will be here forever. I, I would love to do anything, really. That is so cool. That is so cool. Well, guys, we I want will figure to out desktop solitaire if you challenge me. Put it <laughs> on the table. Oh, ladies and gentlemen... We want to thank Ian Flynn so much for being on the podcast. Uh, he took a lot of time out of his day, especially since we had some technical difficulties early on that obviously aren't going to be in the show when we get it all said and done and edited. Uh, but he was, a, he was a trooper. He really stuck with us, and we really appreciate that so much. We got some really awesome information from him. Uh, Mr. Flynn, before we let you go, how can the people talk to you? How can they reach you? And how can they hear more of the great work you're doing and uh, – where can they find your books? Uh, if you want to keep track of what I've got coming up, the conventions I'll be at, and general, all the news about me, head over to my website, bumbleking.com. That's bumble like the bee, king like the monarch, or just Google Ian Flynn, you'll find me. Uh, you'll find me at Twitter, at Ian Flynn BKC. And I've got a bi-weekly podcast, the Bumblecast, that's over at patreon.com backslash Bumblecast. Awesome. Again, we want to thank you so much uh, for being here with us, and we really appreciate it because I know our audience is really going to appreciate this. I mean, I, I don't think I stopped smiling throughout the course of this whole show. Like, I had a big, goofy smile on my face, so I'm really glad that I was in the small box of this conversation today. Uh, but I guess if somebody puts it on their TV, they're going to see that big goofy smile. I can't wait to edit this episode uh, because oh, yes. I just can't wait to hear it all again. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So Thank you so much for being on again, Mr. Flynn. My pleasure. Your pleasure and looking forward to what you're putting out on IDW and arms and dark horse. Thank so guys, so thank, thank him. Hit him up on Twitter for us. Get on Twitter and hit him up and thank him for being on the show. Uh, and uh, that's going to be it for this half of the show. So guys, Remember, tomorrow we're going to have a regular episode, and we're going to mix these two together for one giant spectacular episode. So, guys, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.